Hi, my name's John Mortimer, and I'm going to be talking about complexity in the public sector, in central government, governance, policy, local government, in particular, public sector organisations. And the reason I'm doing this is that if someone said to me, John, what's the one thing that you could do with managers and leaders that would have the greatest impact and quickly, I think it would be this. And this approach is what I use in my work. And it's what I use when I engage with leaders and managers as well to help them to see things in a different perspective. Where this started was when I started to read about complexity, I really didn't understand it. It seemed to be difficult to comprehend and to apply in organisational practice. So I took a different tack and I listened to the people that knew about complexity, but in organisational situations. And I then applied complexity and looked for it in organisations that I was working in. And I actually found that when I did that, it was far simpler. And I also came up with a framework which I now use to help me to do this. And I'm going to go through that framework here. This is about applying complexity to organisational situations. And what are situations? They're anything really. They are um, the way that we manage, the way that we do work in the public sector, the way that people work together in teams, the way that we structure those organisations, the way that we develop departments and the way that we measure and the way that we think about how those organisations are designed. Basically everything. Anything can be a situation. And what I'm going to do now is take you through the two main types of situations that I see and I come across. The first one are logical situations and the second one are complex situations. And we're going to start with logical ones first. So what does this actually mean? Logical situations are those situations which we can see and understand as being step by step. They have cause and effect. The way that we deal with them is that we look at them in detail, we analyze, we get the data, we understand, and then we do something with that. We might, if it's a problem, we'll fix it. This is, an, this is probably the most common set of methods that we apply and that we think about in organizations today. We use logical methods, they're very familiar to us, and we apply them almost automatically. They include developing processes and procedures, having audits, having measures and targets, um, having change using project management, uh, risk analysis, all of these things. And the interesting thing about logical situations is the more we understand them, the more we can control them. And that's, I think, really key to why the methods for logical situations are so important. And if we look at a public sector service, a transactional one like renewing passports, we find that the way that those services are designed are in a logical way. They follow a standard framework. Standard decisions are made in that process. And although there's variation, that variation is standardized. But that's a good example of a logical service and it's highly transactional. The behaviors that we use in a logical situation are logical. They're structured, they're step by step, their cause and effect. And what we're now going to do is we're going to compare this to what is complex. Now complex is very different. Complex are about situations that are ambiguous. We don't really understand them when we look at them. And if we do look at them, we find that we have to go elsewhere to understand more about them. Sometimes they sit outside our sphere of control. So we have to go to other places to understand. And when we do look at them, sometimes they keep changing. And very often with complexity, we can't actually solve complexity because it's so interlinked. Maybe we can only progress it. 
and there may not be a clear solution to dealing with these situations. And the way that we behave towards complexity is not by logical analysis, but by adapting. Before we go into adapting, examples of complexity in the public sector are things like, well, dealing with people in need, how we sort out things in social care, how we work together across services, how we get teams together that have to deal with particular situations. Once we understand the definitions of complexity, we actually find that a lot of the public sector is perhaps complex. And that's why complexity in the public sector is so important. So let's look at how we adapt. When I come across complexity, the first thing that I do is I immerse myself in that situation. So if it's a team that's not working well, for instance, I will sit with that team when they have a meeting. I will sit with individual members of that team when they're doing their work in their workplace. I will observe what's going on. I will observe what's happening in their context. I wouldn't take those people into a room and, ha and have individual conversations with them. And what I do is I immerse myself and I try and make sense of what's going on. And I look at it from different perspectives. And each time I sit with someone, I get a different perspective. Sometimes I do this together with a group. And then when we've understood a situation, we then maybe try something out. We try and change something. We try and do something. And we look at the impact that that has. And then we might go through that loop again. We look at the impact. We try something else out. We change something. So we might try this loop several times and then we start to get an idea as to how this complex situation reacts. So you can see that this is a very different way of dealing with a situation than the logical approach. And to give one example, for instance, if we design something that fixes a broken leg, that seems like a logical approach. If, however, a person comes in with a broken leg and they've fallen down the stairs, because they live on their own, that might introduce complexity into this. And so we might need to look at that from a different perspective and in a different way. It introduces something new to that situation. To summarize then, there are two types of situations, logical and complex. And before I learned about complexity, I used to deal with any situation with the same types of methods and those around me did the same. So regardless of the type, I would apply the methods that I was most familiar with, the ones that I saw that worked before. And one of the things that I've realized is that when I go into an organization and I see that happening, I find that what's actually going on is that we're applying logical methods to a complex situation. And that's one of the reasons why very often this doesn't work very well. So, Logical methods are fine for logical situations, but they're not very good for complex situations. In fact, they may not resolve the problem. They may push things into a different direction than what we expect. They may fix something in one place, but actually something else appears somewhere else. Or it might just be a situation that we just cannot resolve, regardless of how much we, tr we try. These are all characteristics of when we're not dealing with complex situations in the right way. Why do we behave this way? Why don't we know about complexity? Over a hundred years ago, someone called Frederick Taylor developed something called scientific management. Um, what that was about was a scientific approach to understanding how organizations worked, how we manage within those organizations. And what that looks like is like a machine. So you've got inputs, you've got something in the middle that's making something, and then you've got outputs. And you have people in the work that do the, the work itself, and they work to a set of procedures and rules that are developed by managers. Those managers oversee and check that the right thing is going on within the organization. And they use procedures, audits, they use measures and targets to ensure that those things happen at the right time and in the right way. So that's typical of the Taylorist approach to how an organization works. And we've been living with this for 
over 100 years. In the 1980s in the public sector in many countries, we developed something called new public management. And what that was, was the introduction of this mechanistic way of looking at organisations into the public sector. And this meant that we would fragment something that was very long and difficult into individual discrete departments and services. We would use central control. We would use measures to understand and control. We would use targets. We would standardise. We would use di digital approaches to reducing cost. So these are all mechanistic approaches and mechanistic methods in general. And we still have that. And that's what we're used to. That's what we grew up with. So that's why when we see complexity, we tend to apply those logical methods. When I work in organisation, there is something else that I, I can see. And that is, I see that managers are very busy and they very often act on things that are urgent. For instance, they have responsibility to achieve a budget by the end of a certain time period. And there's other pressures on busy managers. So what that tends to do is to drive fixing those problems. They tend to be short term, but the characteristic is they tend to be urgent. And the way that we deal with urgent things is quite interesting because actually what we do is we just want to fix it and get on with the next thing. So the, the behavior that we have and the methods that we have are, let's get that done and move on to something next. What we often do is use logical methods to deal with those situations. We don't really have the time to sit back and look at these and deal with them in the right way. What I'd like to show is the fact that there might be three different types of situations in organizations. And the critical ones might be the ones that are very obvious. If you do see this, I suggest that we move from dealing with a critical situation so it's not quite so critical anymore, and then move on to deciding, is this a logical or a complex situation that we have? Move on from firefighting, resist firefighting when you have some of these issues, especially complex issues. When I was working in the health sector, we were looking at how the current system worked. And we found that sometimes things went really quite well. And other demands really were very messy and they just went all over the place and they caused a lot of resource and a lot of wasted time and the outcome wasn't very satisfactory. Over time we realized that actually there are two types of demands that we could then recognize. One of them was fix me, which was more of a transactional demand. And actually that suited the healthcare system quite well. But a lot of them were actually help me and those were complex. Those weren't down to one service or one issue. And when a complex demand came in and it was dealt with by a transactional logical system, it did not fit very well. When we realized that it helped us to recognize that actually in some cases we needed to work very differently. In healthcare, what we then ended up doing is we took a team of frontline people and they worked in a different way to the normal logical approach that the organization told them they had to do. They were able to be flexible and decide themselves how best to react to demands. So what they did is, for instance, they put aside things like assessments and referrals and just went to understand the situation in front of them. So they went to the house where the person lived. We took 35 of these demands and this is what we found. The number of, of assessments dropped 64%. The number of people involved in the work that we were doing end to end dropped by 32%. The referrals that we needed to do dropped by 41%. The face to face time that we had with patients increased from 46 to 60% of our time we calculated what would be the returning demand in the traditional way of working compared to the new way of working. And we thought that we would reduce the returning demand by 71%. And this is really interesting. The total number of hours that we actually spent end to end in total for each one of these dropped by 14%. This demonstrates that 
when we actually fundamentally apply different ways of working, that everything changes. It's not just about one or two things. This is one of my favorite diagrams. Um, and the reason for that is that it demonstrates so well what we normally end up doing. We normally end up in a certain place looking at things logically and then when we actually open the door of the reality of what's going on outside, we realize that everything is very different out there. And our reaction is to close that door. I'm suggesting that we do open the door and that we do step outside and we start to become comfortable with understanding and how to deal with complexity. Look for patterns, look for things, don't try and solve, but try and understand. Housing, for instance, provision of housing in the public sector. The way that we've designed that is, we, in the UK at least, we've currently designed it using a transactional logical approach. But the service itself, is that logical or is it complex? And the only way to understand that is to sit with people that come in and say, hey, I need help with my housing. Now, we did this in Yarmouth and what were the outcomes? Well, after two years, one of the outcomes was that the waiting list dropped from over 6,000 to 300. The number of appeals that we had every month, which was 27, dropped to one a year. And the number of appeals indicates the satisfaction that people have with the service, because the more appeals, the more dissatisfaction. And we also found that failure demand, which is the demand that the service has caused repeat demands to come back in, dropped right down. These are examples of what happens when we actually go to a complex service and apply complex methods. It fundamentally changes the nature of that service. And in the case of Yarmouth, what actually happened is, even though we improved people's outcomes significantly, we reduced the work involved, the number of people that needed to do this actually dropped. So due to Frederick Taylor's ideas, what we tend to do is automatically go for these logical approaches and assessments is a good example. And when we were working in health and social care, we replaced that with how do we understand people in a different way? We didn't throw assessments away, but what we found was that the use of assessments drove the way that we understood. That wasn't what it was designed to do. So what we did is distance ourselves from those assessments and used alternative methods and then use the assessments to actually help us later on. We went through the end-to-end -end design of what actually happened to people that had health issues. So we didn't map the whole health system. That would have been ridiculous and it would have been an enormous diagram. And it wouldn't really tell us anything except it would tell us that this is a very complex system. So what we actually did is that we followed people from end to end. And this is one example of what that looks like. This is a journey of someone that came through the health service over a period of two years. And we mapped and we went through every single time that we engaged with them, every single activity that we did. So this gives us a picture of what the end-to-end -end actually looks like across all the health and local authority steps that they went through. And this was in contrast to the sort of standard approach which we generally use, which is let's split up this complexity into discrete services and standardize those services. What actually happens when you do that is you apply a logical method. What we did is exactly the opposite. We didn't take those services. We just took people at their face value and decided what help and the support that they needed and passed them on and gave them the right expertise. So what we did with the variety that comes into the public sector is that we absorbed that variety. We didn't standardize it. And so it's very typical for us to want to standardize. And when we apply digital to the services that we have very often, that those digital methods will lock in standardization and logical approaches to potentially complex situations. And one of the reasons that we see demand rising and resources increasing 
is because we have this mismatch. And if you change the way that we work, actually costs go down and demand reduces at the same time, as well as outcomes being far better. The logical mind is fine and great for dealing with logical situations. And the way that we would do that is by using explicit data and explicit knowledge. So that's the way that we would approach logical situations. And complex situations, we would use implicit knowledge, the kind of knowledge that isn't easily kept within data itself. We would talk to people and understand what's in their head. We would look at patterns. We would look at themes. We would understand individual citizens and where they're coming from and what matters to them. And by doing that, we would start to build a different type of picture than what we, than what we might know. We would resist categorization. We would resist personas. And we would try to design in that variation and flexibility into the, into the organizations and services that we've created. And dealing with the right hand side, implicit, it's more about being comfortable with people having different perspectives and different views and being comfortable with the fact that we don't have clarity as to what the outcome might be. I urge you don't run away from complexity, but embrace it in the management and design of the work that we all do. In terms of how that might look like in an organization, we might see that employees roles become more blurred. They might work across departments in cross-functional teams with the permission and ability to deal with variety when they come across it. Managers might rely less on measures and more on learning about what's going on and helping frontline people to do their job well. And leadership moves from top down to ensuring people are doing the right thing and working across those boundaries that we've artificially put in those organizations, designing around the variation and dealing with complexity. Well, I hope this has helped you. Uh, it certainly helps me. And if you want to take this any further, have any questions, want to give me some pointers or feedback on this, please don't hesitate to get into contact. Thank you.